because usually I put them like this so I can read my second monitor because it's just <laughs> far enough away. Yeah, when you turn 42, your eyes just go, screw you, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Um, we are live. I actually just went to the eye doctor recently. So um, um, my eyes are pretty much the same after eight years. Well, that's good, right? We're not we're not sliding downwards. We're, we're, we're staying the same. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. My nieces, my nie two of my nieces just uh, got glasses. So they're like, oh, you know, part of the club. <laughs> Super <laughs> cute. Is they, they my look, niece they is they always like me. wanting you to take them off and then says, now you look normal. <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah. but this is who I am with. I, I always wear glasses. Anyway, um, okay, so we are live. And um, I guess we'll just all of us introduce ourselves, um, us first, and then uh, sure. Nate, Nate, you can introduce yourself. Um, yeah. So I, I'm Hillary Van Ness, and I wrote Empath Uncovered, and I'm working on my new novel, Empath Empowered. And um, I just thought that it was really important to talk about being an empath because I didn't feel growing up like I had the support or the knowledge of what it meant, and I felt alone in that aspect and respect. So... Um, I've been trying to get people who identify as empaths as well on to talk to them um, on social media and through lives. And so anybody who's watching, if you know any more empaths, I'm starting to run out of people I know. <laughs> yeah, it's over here. Oh, dang it, over here. It's all over here. <laughs> I got it right. <laughs> um, so I'm all, yeah, I'm looking for more people. I only have maybe two two more people I could call on and then a repeat. And maybe if you want to come back, Nate. So it just, uh, I might re start re repeating. Look, you know, let's let this interview go first and you'll see if I have anything that's positive, it's like good to say. And you're like, yeah, we can have him back or not. We're just, hey, you know, we just gotta pick up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, MB, why don't you go next? Cool. Hi, I'm Mary Beth. I am not a writer, but I am an empath and I'm just here for moral support for Hillary. <laughs> Always. Okay, I guess that's me. Uh, uh, so my name is Nathan Reedy. I'm good friends with Hillary. Uh, congratulations on your book, by the way. I think that's super awesome. I'd love to talk to you about that a little bit before we get into it. As far as being an empath, you know, this, yes, I do identify as that, but no, not just that, you know, intuitive, creative. I mean, there's a bunch of different labels you could probably go ahead and apply to it, but you and I have had some great conversations in the past about what that experience has been like. <clears throat> and as you mentioned, um, not having a ton of support kind of growing up and, and being younger or whatever, I would say my experience has been very similar. Uh, even though there's been many, many people right next to me, um, right by my side that have been much more empathic, right? It's like you, you kind of have an event that happens and you realize that this has been something that's been going on for, for a long, long time. And so that's kind of my history. You know, I'm going to be 43 this year. And I'd say it's, you know, 20 years of just kind of self-reflective, introspective, trying to figure certain things out, just a, a natural drive or, or inclination to want to know more. The best way to understand our world is to understand ourselves. And that led into what we might describe as a label of, of empath. I think it's much more vast than that, obviously. But um, yes, empath is one of those labels that also would apply. Yeah, that's why I typically say who identifies as an empath, because actually MB and I were talking uh, an hour ago about how it's um, it's not like, oh, you're diagnosed as an empath. Very much <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Um, I resonate with this. I respond to this. This is okay. I'm building a community that I need because I feel yeah. like labels, um, when they're put on you, are negative. And when you put labels on yourself, they can be very um, inclusive and make you feel seen and supported sure. for the first time. Sure. And then also, I should have started with this, but um, maybe if both of you say how you know me, cause I kind of started this, but it might help people to know how we got connected. Sure. So MB, yeah, you, you go ahead, Mary. <laughs> uh, I met Hillary at a con uh, supernatural uh, TV show convention. Cool. And we kind of just hit it off because I saw her at the PJ party that the, um, couple of the gals have and it's just it's grown from there i have the photo of us me and her behind me but you can't you, oh, okay. all over the place. But yeah, you can't see her so sorry. No. but um yeah it's uh mostly an internet friendship but that's kind of how the world is at this moment so 
Right. I don't see any reason that's that's wrong. <laughs> well, it's no, interesting no. because we met once in person, and now we're like super close, and we have no photos together, not one, <laughs> and it's just like the craziest thing. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I met Hillary through the acting community here in Sacramento. Um, probably, if I had to pinpoint, probably the, the PCS, a place called Sacramento Venue, um, through mutual acting friends and things like that. Um, and that leads into, you know, hangouts and whatever else. And so probably what led to the, the conversation that led to this um, interview, I remember having at a wing place in Elk Grove. And we just kind of stumbled across this 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 topic, which, you know, a lot of times, and I think we're probably we'll end up touching on it during this interview, is that as somebody who identifies as empathic or an empath, you don't feel like there's a lot of people out in the world kind of like like you. And so it was also a bit of a strange thing too. And I know that Hillary's asked me this uh, prior as a small primer to this this conversation, what it's like to be a male empath, right? And so we start having this conversation and we're just like, you know, that that familiar right in sync kind of you know connection about at least shared experience in the sense of understanding. But um, yeah. And so we we gapped like girls for hours, you know, and it was it was uh, it was a good conversation. It was a good conversation. So I'd say that uh, and we've hung out a few times since then as well. Obviously, the world's closed down right now. And so we're all kind of staying inside. And, and this is the new norm. I think this is super awesome, though, because it pushes entrepreneurial ventures like this. But that that's how I would say that I I, I met Hillary through the acting community then. Oh, hey, you're like me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Community, building community. I'm all about community. <laughs> yeah. exactly. So you had said that maybe you wanted to ask me some questions before we dive. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Before, before we dive in all the meat of, of what we're going to talk about, the main subject, number one, congratulations on writing a book. How many pages is it? Um, she has it in front of her. I don't. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm still reading it. I feel terrible. Uh, 151 pages. It's it's quite a quite an accomplishment, right? Not so, the two white blank pages at the end for no reason. reason. <laughs> That's for you. So you can sign. That's where you can sign, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, <laughs> so before we get into it, so for me, I've been a freelance graphic designer for you know about 15, 20 years. I, I uh, incorporated my company in 2004. So whatever that math is. Now the whole reason why I did that is because it's very much into entrepreneurship, and then as the the world has kind of progressively gone along. Amazon specifically has had a lot of um, self-publishing opportunities. I know some friends that were trying to do, you know, films through them. I, at one point, they had some sort of branch that did that. But the thing that stuck around was the self-publishing, right? And I find that interesting because not only are we, you know, empaths or whatnot, we're also creatives. I think there's a, kind of like a lot of overlap when it comes to that type of stuff. Um, but to be able to create a potential revenue source for yourself. With your art, I mean, it's basically pretty much all our all, all artists' dreams, you know, um, or all, all artists' dreams. So to be able to do that, I think, is quite interesting, just from the logistical standpoint. So if you could just like just take two and a half minutes to, you know, describe what that experience was like, what the pro, I mean, even the tedious process of getting it up there, that type of thing, and then you know, what what is what is delivery like? Because I know you're doing it both through Kindle and also print, which you which which Mary Beth actually has one. So that's that's pretty awesome. Just from an entrepreneurial venture standpoint and a freelance standpoint, I think that's dope. So I'd be just curious to know what that experience is like. Okay. Yeah. So I don't, doing something that short is very difficult for me, but I will do my best. Oh, so that would, that would actually would have been, oh, sorry. Sorry. Not the book. The, the, the inter, okay, gotcha. Go ahead. I'll shut up. <laughs> no, yeah. The, 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 the yeah. my answer might not be two minutes. It might be longer. It probably will be your show. You do what you want. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is my show. Uh, so I'm not used to having that. Um, anyway, so I went into it wanting to do it all for free, which is uh, pretty unrealistic. Uh, so I wrote it really quickly. I've been writing my entire life. So that just came easy to me. It wasn't a big deal to write a novel. Uh, I mean, it should have it is but <laughs> it just didn't feel like it yeah. and so i got that through really quick and then it was just a year of trying to get the logistics and get it figured out i had my aunt edit it um which was a little difficult because she didn't have a laptop to start off with so it was just like really back and forth we were doing like and she wanted to make sure that she was doing stuff that i would approve of um and that it was still like in the same vein of where I was going. And um, 
so that was a really great free way to do it. And then she didn't expect me to dedicate it to her because oh, yeah. Uh, I did. Yeah, it's aunt, my aunt Devon. Yeah. So um, she's in the in the front. She's so dedicated to my aunt and friends and family, of course. Because without them, it wouldn't have happened. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, so I did that, and then um. I was looking around for, you know, posting online. I got some more connections from friends through that way. I I created an empath Facebook page right. uh, way before, not way, but like before I finished the novel, which um, I didn't realize was super good. <laughs> Everybody recommends doing that, but I just wanted to do it. Sure, sure. And um, so I did that and I was looking around for, I think, so I edited it and then I was just like, I'm done. I just don't want to do it. Okay, so I just need to move on. I need to move to the next step. So I think I got, yeah. I was looking for, oh no, I, 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 I actually had the cover art also before I finished the novel. Oh, cool. Um, thank you, Mary Beth, for nodding. It's like trying to remember the process. Um, so I had, yeah, I had the cover art from a friend I met on my first day on one of the PCS film sets. Sure. And um, so I, ha I had that, was going back and forth with him. That I, I paid for that, but it was affordable, um, which is nice. And then I was looking for a formatter and it was between two. Um, one was way too expensive. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was um, giving me the same amount that the expensive one would for probably less than half of sure. what it would have been for that person. And sure. so she was doing, I love her. I'm going to use her again. She's in, she, I credited her in it and let mm -hmm. her know I was, cause I was like, you're good. <laughs> it looks really nice. And mm -hmm. so we went back and forth a couple of times and she, you know, cause there was a couple of problems with um, Amazon where like the cover wasn't, it didn't fit right. Or like yeah. the ISBN number was only on the inside. It wasn't on the outside. And so stuff that she needed to fix. Cause I don't know what to do. Right. right. And Oh, I did also get it copywritten, which was money as well. Okay. So yeah. it was cheaper than it could have been. And I did go the cheaper way. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to self publish. I also wanted it to be in my control. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. The way I do everything in my life is different than to how normal people and just normal people and society and everything um, does do things. So I was like, just because everybody's done it this way doesn't mean that I need to do it that way. Right. And I also was a little bit afraid that if I tried to get somebody else to publish it, uh, I would never get published. Uh, why, why? Because someone might steal it or something? N no, just because they have to like, oh, maybe that's not not with publishing, but it, I just, I thought that they had to like approve it in order to publish it or, or like somebody oh, had to be like, this is good enough to publish as opposed to just being like anything you write, you can publish yourself. Man, you know, it's interesting. So because of being in freelance and, and why I got into freelance, I mean, this is a whole nother topic I will not bore you with, but you know, the, the barriers to entry are, are removed for us. You know, now we may not have shelf space on a Barnes and Noble or Border, but you know, if you want to pick up a book that talks about this specific a book that one of the many, many books that have changed my life is The Long Tail. You know, all you need is a few fans. You know, so to a degree, I've kind of operated in the same vein, the same sense. You're you're talking about bootstrapping, you know, with your own effort and you know your own my our own limited bank accounts and things like that. And uh, you know, to be able to do that, yeah, it might be a longer path. But number one, I don't need to ask permission. And number two, if there is success. I don't have to sell my success for you know 90% of what I might actually make of it, you know? And so I think it's good, good to sharpen the saw that way to use the Stephen Covey phrase, uh, because it'll teach you a lot about what you're capable of, but also what your actual value is. So when you come to a negotiation table, because at some point when you hit massive success, you know, like we all are going to, <laughs> um, you know, then, then the, the, the powers that be, the people with the deep pockets, you know, they're, they're going to have to, you're gonna have to deal with somebody who's experienced versus you know somebody who's not, and so you get to keep much more of of well above what you made. You know your passion, your babies, your you know your power, whatever whatever you want to call it in in, the, in those same veins. And so I, I love it. Like I said, I've been doing this for many many years, and that was the reason why I got into it is because of the same thing that you're already doing. And there's so many more opportunities for creatives to make their stuff these days and actually get eyeballs on it. You know, so yeah. for me, I think that's awesome. You may not consider it a success story, but I love small business that way. 
and and yeah i mean yeah you get me all kinds of excited I remember my first beginnings when it comes to all this stuff awesome yeah <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, well, so all my, if at some point I'm going to put this up on my YouTube, but right now, if you're watching on Facebook or whatever else, go to my page, all that description stuff, the or social media, the book, um, Mary Beth, I didn't get a chance to get yours, but we can update the description after the fact. And, you know, um, so go, go, go find the book, support local artists yeah. right? and uh, do all that. Yes, I'm not putting words in her mouth. She, I asked her, and she's like, "No, this is your thing. I'm just supporting okay. you." I'm <laughs> just here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, so awesome. Okay, cool. So, um, I guess the first question that we've always been asking people is what, which maybe you've already touched on a little bit, is what does the word empath mean to you specifically? Well, I mean, empath. Oh sh. Yeah, so I'm gonna try to whittle it down and quantify it. Um, in the sense that we're talking about, about somebody who is an empath, <clears throat> there's a lot of layers to it, you know, but but in terms of where I would come, I guess I would start with like the, the 10,000 foot view is that there's just kind of this either honed or naturally ordained um, like ability or, or, or focus that, that it kind of feels an awful lot like getting messages, you know, from, from everything around you. For me, mostly human beings, you know, and it could come from a lot of different areas. Like I still haven't been able to identify where it has come from. It always just feels felt like something that I've always had, but the way in which I've defined it has changed a lot over the years. If you were to ask me this when I was in my early twenties or whatnot, I would not have said that I was an empath. I wouldn't even necessarily have had the vocabulary to describe that. Um, I, I was around a lot of people that they may not even use that word, you know, but as I've gone through the progression of my life, the older that you get, the more wise you become, there are things that come kind of like, oh yeah, empath. And then I realized that there's a ripple effect all the way back through. So I would just say a certain level of heightened acute awareness about, for me, because of it's what I, it usually stems around things that I massively care about. So things that are high stakes, like the human beings in my life. Right. So, um, these things could come from trauma. They could be naturally ordained. It could be one of those things where there's certain levels of creativity and inspiration that are involved with it. So I think all these things mixed up into this nice stew of what would might be defined or, you know, very um, poorly described as being an empath. But for me, you know, I guess a heightened sense of, of understanding and, and um, of, of people, you know, and circumstances and the things that are around you walk into a room and it feels like, walking through pockets of people's energies, you know, you can define it in a bunch of different terms like claircognizance, clairvoyance, clairsentience, you know, intuition, like whatever it is that you want. And so for me, it's always been like that, but somebody might've just said, oh, you know, he's just extra sensitive. <laughs> that, that, they might just describe it like that. Um, so it's probably a poor example or, or, or definition, but something along those lines, you know, I don't know if that's helpful if you want to ask further questions about it. No, I don't think it's a it's a bad definition in any way because it's your definition. It doesn't really matter what other people think about it. And I'm sure that it'll help somebody somewhere sure. Sure. who resonates with it. And um, you said some stuff in there that I agree with as well. Like um, for me specifically, it's um, I, I can go out like some empaths have trouble going out in public because it's just so intense right. and so overwhelming. And yeah. but I. I go out and I'm pretty much fine. I don't notice it as much. It's it's more with like people I really care about, like sure. what you were saying, people who are important to me in my life. I love and I care about, and I know, and I'm closer with them, and so, so I can pick up on what's going on with them. Sometimes, uh, my difficulty is knowing when it's theirs and when it's mine because I always think that it's fair. Mine. fair. <laughs> Uh, why it was I'm angry? I was fine two seconds ago. What's going on? <laughs> um, so that's how that's how it manifests for me. Um, I've had crazy experiences happen in the past. You know, at the risk of potentially making my sound self sound somebody like you know who's a bit nutsy or whatnot. For me, I, I I wouldn't I would have experiences where I didn't understand what was like happening to me, right? And I'm like, this is crazy. This this actually leads into me trying to research this and figure this out, even going to like psychologists and, and, and you know, um, whatnot, because, you know, 
it just seems so unfathomable that this could actually be true, especially kind of coming from where I where I come from, which is I've never really believed in that type of stuff very much. Um, I just thought I was somebody who was a bit more charming and had a bit more rapport building. You know, my father used to run a grocery store 30 years in retail management, customer service. I was like, I just thought I was that, you know, guy that could go ahead and start conversations with people. But I would also notice the way that I would do that is through connecting with what I would get a sense of what they they felt most of the time. Right. So I think one of the superpowers of being an empath is that you have the ability to, to, to tune in in a way because everybody wants to feel special and important. You can actually really specifically listen. And I am genuinely interested. So, but I'd have things that would happen to me that I'm just like, holy shit, like I feel crazy. You know, like this is, this is not, this is not good. And it happened over a period of time. It would always be few and far in between. But I remember at one point asking my father back in the day, like, do we have any mental illness in our family? You know what I mean? Because it would just seem so, so real, right? Like I refer to it as like knowing with your knower, right? I would walk through a crowd of people and I would just like, it almost seemed like somebody turning a radio dial, right? I'd walk through booth by booth by booth. Uh, the more drinks that I would have, the more my, my, my frontal lobe would be suppressed. It would make it worse. So it was almost like I would just, cause you never know if it's true. I never walked up and asked them, but like, is this what's going on? Like this person broke up with that person. Like this person likes this guy that, you know, is whatever, you know? And so it's just like this overwhelming beam of like this person's energy. And this person is like, Holy shit. Like, ah, I don't know what's going on. And so it would feel like that at times, you know? And so I've had several experiences happen, like all the way from my twenties, all the way up until, you know, well, it's still now it's just much more manageable now because I understand what's happening. So it doesn't throw you so much into a tizzy or fight or flight isn't so amped up. You're so hyper vigilant about what's going on. So now I understand it. Actually, fast forward a lot. Um, actually went to a spiritual counselor for about a year and she's in my friends list. Um, uh, on my Facebook, Cassandra McCallan, I think she's hands of light, whatever I, she, she's, I would say she's the one that helped me realize t- definably that I am an empath. She did energy work with me in terms of like showing me what energy was I'm like, Oh, I recognize that because when I sit next to somebody, when I'm acting like, this is what I feel. And this is what I accept. You know, you get a great sense when you're in the pocket and have just an amazing scene with somebody that they're actually feeling the things that are, you know, the opposite of what you're going through, um, as an actor or whatnot, I'm like, Oh, okay. So she helped define it for me. And I was like, boom, okay, cool. And then she kind of taught me how to control it for myself. It li- almost to the point where you're like able to re- elicit, um, you know, like the, the secret almost elicit responses from the universe, you know, the way you want to use that vocabulary. I would describe it as also something else, but in general, um, yeah, I think I went off on a tangent a bit, but that's, I've had some crazy things happen like that to the point where I thought, well, maybe I'm a bit mentally ill, you know, and like, oh, shit, I guess I better start taking meds or something like that. The truth is, it's just was happening to me over a long period of time. And I was just, it became to a point where it was so not crippling, but so stressful that uh, I just had to kind of accept and, and, and look in, in directions that I, I would never look. I remember calling her and saying, I am a huge skeptic. I do not believe in this. I go, but here's what the opportunity is for you. It's if you can help me understand this and you're right, you're going to make the best way to make the biggest mouthpiece is to convert a, convert a critic. So you, here's, here's the thing. And within 25 minutes of sitting in her office uh, and her doing an energy uh, experiment with me, I was like, holy shit. Okay. This makes, now I know with my knower, this makes a lot of sense. Now, what do I do with it after? So. And oh. can you explain a little bit more what you mean when you say no with your knower? Cause they, you're the only person I've ever heard say it like that. So I'm curious. Um, so shit. Okay. You try to go, you go Sorry. Back. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, the thing about it is knowing with your knower is kind of like this. And, and, and the reason why us empaths are very, very skeptical about our abilities is because we are, there's a very fine line between getting something and also projecting the shit out of onto people. Right. So it's hard to know because we've got our biases, we've got our, our, um, our wants, you know, we might've gotten, not gotten enough sleep, sleep that day. We might've not, not, we might need to get laid, you know, it could be a whole bunch of different things. So, you know, it's one of those things where it's really hard to know with your knower because it, it takes a certain level of risk, but it's that feeling on the inside of you. That's almost like an aha or, you know, okay, this is right. The way that I've experienced this before, you know, they talk about modalities of, of, of getting of like channeling. This is where like intuitive might, might play into this, but uh, you're, you're clairvoyant, claircognizant, clairsentient, um, clairaudient. And I forgot what the fifth one is, at least how, how they've kind of described it. 
And so what I would notice those 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 things of getting information from people kind of walking through, I would say it would kind of be described like almost from like an audio sense. But I'm I'm a graphic designer, so I'm very visual. But I would also get what they might refer to as downloads, and that's like things like I just know. That's clear cognizant, right? I would just know, and that's it. It's like you get that, and you're like, oh shit. Uh, I don't know that I know that, but then when you go out and kind of test, you're almost kind of proof what you're, what you're, uh, what you feel like you know, right? So once you start to understand what that feeling is like by by having a few of those moments and then testing a few of those moments, knowing that your knower becomes much stronger because you learn to trust that feeling on the inside of you. I unfortunately learned how to trust my knowing my knower with a lot of cheating exes and a lot of bad situations like that. Like we just wake up with intuitive sparks or. You see the girl that you're having a secret relationship with uh, in the middle of class, pick up her phone. Nothing different about picking up the phone. It's the way that she picked up the phone. It's like she's cheating or she's done with you or, it, you know, that kind of stuff. And so over a period of time, this is what kind of helped me be concerned about whether I was crazy or not. Because I would just know it was going to happen. Predicting divorces before they happened years before, like, you know, like a year and a half before with a friend. I'm like, I don't know why it is, but I'm so emotionally moved by it. I can't I can't stop crying for them. You know what I mean? So. Knowing with your knower is like this thing that you, you just get better at over a period of time going through this path of, okay, so this is what I think is actually going to happen based on the energy that I'm getting. Holy shit, let's see how this plays out. Oh my God, I was way more right than I thought I ever would be. And not knowing why, by the way, like it still is unfathomable. There are certain things that have happened that I'm just like, am I just projecting the holy little shit out of this? Like, am I just jealous? Am I like, what is going on here? But you just know, you just know. Yeah, for me, it's definitely I get and it's a woman thing as well, because um, I'm a massive overthinker. So it's a lot of times like and I'm trying to see things from every side and every angle, which could be an empath thing as well. So it's yeah. like, OK, this is probably how this person's feeling if I'm not already picking up on it. And then that's why they reacted this way. But that doesn't mean that it like excuses their behavior or, you know, whatever, like. Uh, yeah. Even the bad situations I've gotten into, I could understand why the other person did what they did, but that doesn't excuse what they did. And yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, I feel like when you say knowing with your knower, it's how I say like I just know. I don't know how I know. I just know. Like yeah. for example, there was some some time re somewhat recently within the past couple of years. Um, I had a friend who just kind of, I don't know, we, we hung out a bunch. And then the last time we ever hung out, um, I was like, are you okay? Cause I'm just like, it's like, we've been having fun and stuff, but it just feels different. And he, and they said, oh, you can feel that. And I was like, yeah. And then they kind of like ghosted me and sure. then yeah. would come back like nothing had happened. Yeah. Like nothing had changed. Like they hadn't ghosted me. Yeah. And, yeah. and I was like, mm, okay, that's not okay. And I said, I was just like, very honest. I said, you need to tell me what's going on. Cause yeah. something is going on. If you don't tell me what's going on, I feel like I'm a crazy person. Yeah. You know? Cause, cause you know, they might be lying to themselves. Like maybe they're, they're fine or they don't want to tell you or whatever, but it was like, I had to just end it because I couldn't deal with being ghosted and then having them come back like, oh, I'm going to see you this week, right? Well, where where the hell were you? Like, why now? Like, I'm just yeah. supposed to, I'm not going to drop everything. So it was just very much, that was a more recent, like, I feel the more I trust myself, the yeah. more accurate I realize I am about things. Sure. And of course, I was close with this person. So it was just very interesting to go from them realizing that, Mm -hmm. Oh, you can see that. <clears throat> I don't want you to see that. So I'm going to go yeah. away and That's try right. to deal with it and not tell you. And then when you say, I feel like a crazy person, please tell, you don't have to tell me what's going on. I don't need to know specifics. Just tell me <laughs> something's going on. Tell me you're going through something. Tell me, t tell me I'm not a crazy person. Like, please put me out of my yeah. misery. I literally yeah. said that. And then nothing. And so I was like, I'm ending this friendship. I can't do this. You know? Yeah. It's hard. I mean, you know, once again, this is all, all the conversation that we're having is based on the speculation that we are absolutely what we're talking about. It's not just some sort of, you know, labyrinth of the mind kind of belief about what we've got going on. But assuming that we're absolutely accurate in what we do, what I would say in my experience, too, is absolutely what you're talking about is, you know, if you're if you're especially the people that you're around the most, you have much more of a history and a baseline for, mm -hmm. for what there is. And, and, and so you like kind of know, you know, to me, it's the same thing. Like 
you know, you might watch something in a romantic movie where somehow they just know when to go ahead and kiss and it's so passionate and whatever, like you just resonate with like what they're feeling. It's like, oh my God, you're, you're, you're moved because you're watching this. You're like, I wonder what the actors were going through when they were <laughs> experiencing that shit. But it's the same thing when it's somebody you care about, you've got a long history with, you have a baseline. So you've got a lot more history to go and calculate whatever that math is or whatever's going on in your head. But the other thing too is this, is that, you know, look, we don't represent ourselves completely 100% the way that we actually really are. You know, our deepest concerns, fears, secrets, whatever, you know, like I, I, I'm, I'm setting this thing. I was recording this thing for this promo today. And I'm like, I, all I can think about is how fat my cheeks are because of, you know, COVID five pounds. But the thing is, is that like, I don't want people to know that shit. You know what I mean? So when it's somebody who's your significant other and they're going through something, you know, especially if it's a, like a life changing thing, I, I would say uh, uh, my very first serious girlfriend, I could probably read her like a book, but she fucking hated it, you know? And she, why would, I was like a dog with a bone too. It was one of those things where I kind of learned, have learned now to like, let it go but I would not let her off the hook. Well, shit, if I'm just, I basically I'm forcing her to face the, 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 the most terrifying things that she would ever face on the planet. Also expecting that she just knows everything about what her issues are. It's, you know, so I'm not only pointing a finger out, you know, why you're fucked up is going, well, make sure you look at why you're fucked up. You know, it's like, no one wants to deal with that shit, you know? And so <laughs> I've had to learn how to be a lot more accepting uh, about that. You know, also basically coming down to this is like, I've got a lot of flaws. I've got a lot of things that, you know, are issues that I've had to look into to dealing with. The more I fix myself, the more I go ahead and have these epiphanies, the more I unpack past traumas and, you know, see the benefits and the, and the curses from them. You know, it's like, I get it. You know, I'm usually super chill, you know, or I try to be as chill as I possibly can. There are the occasional moments when I have something that I really, really want at high stakes and it sucks me right back into all that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, nobody wants to be called out on their bullshit. And I have been notorious in the past for like really forcing calling people out on their bullshit. It's like, dude, no wonder, wonder, no wonder they got to be away from you. You know what I mean? No wonder they just got to cut it off. It's like, yeah, I thought it was being, Hey, guess what? I can fix you. No, my, man, no, no. You know, people got to fix themselves. They really do. So. Yeah. My, um, something I've always said, or at least started saying recently is I seek to understand. Sure. I seek to understand my own emotion. So, yeah. I feel crazy when I don't understand why I'm feeling a spe yes. specific way about something. Like, why am I upset? Why am I crying? Um, sure. I need to know. If I don't know, then I feel crazy. And I don't sure. like feeling crazy because yeah. society already kind of puts that onto women is when they get overly emotional, they're crazy. So sure. just don't call me crazy is from a movie. I think that was, I can't remember. Uh -huh. I think it might have, uh, it was with Will Smith, but it was, he was a superhero or something. And it was, his thing was don't call him. Oh, I can't oh, remember. It, was, must be, it must be Hancock. Yeah. Must yeah. Be, you know, a douche or something. And then yeah. hers was don't call me crazy. <laughs> like, yeah. Or asshole. His was asshole. Yeah. Um, don't call me an asshole. And hers was don't call me crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that resonated so much with the don't call me crazy because I feel crazy. Uh, <laughs> but now I'm starting to think that maybe the seeking to understand is not necessarily just a me thing. It could be an empath thing. We We want to understand what's going on. We want to be able to help other people. Um, I think th my experience was just, that was my first time where somebody wasn't being honest necessarily with me or, yeah. I yeah. mean, cause I didn't, I don't need specifics. I really don't. I just need to know something is going sure. on. Are you mm -hmm. having a rough time? Don't tell me why you're having a rough time. Just say I'm going through something and I will be fine. Yeah. But yeah. I wasn't even given that. So yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, I definitely can understand the plight when it comes to that. Um, for me, knowing that I don't want necessarily, like, I'm pretty open, I'm pretty vulnerable. Like, the more, I, I think being vulnerable and authentic and congruent is is a kind of like a like a general best philosophy for life. You know, if I've got some issues and things like that, yeah, I, I don't necessarily believe in fake it till you make it. I believe, you know, work on it until, you know, you're better at it and then work on it until you're it's congruently integrated in part of who it is that you are. You know, but I don't want people calling me on out on stuff. I mean, I'm open to it. Yeah, I've dealt with a lot of it. I, I, I would say this. I have a, a council of a lot of amazing people, you know, um, and you kind of know with your knower with that, too, uh, who those people are that are going to tell you the things that need to be heard. You know, I have to be open. There's a lot of people go, you know, well, what do you think is wrong? And then they hear it and they go, that's not true, you know, because they're actually not really willing to hear what, 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 what's going on is you have to kind of have a, a certain level of, of I want to grow. And, and I realize that 
on the opposite side of, of, of pain is probably a lot of like liberation and empowerment, you know, or iron, iron sharpens iron or whatever else you got going on. So you have to have people mm -hmm. in your life that can be critics. You have to invite them to be critics because there's a difference between a critic and a hater. A hater just doesn't, just wants to see you fail. You know, I know we don't like the word critic or critique these days, but in general, the thing about a critic, especially if you invite them into your life, you only invite people that you know have your best interests at heart, right? And also believe in this sense of, I'm not going to compromise my integrity to 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 make you feel better, Nathan. Right. So, you know, uh, harsh truth versus a comfortable lie, those kinds of things. And so, you know, but I still, you know, it's only when I'm ready to have that be something that I can talk about. And so knowing that that's how I am, I try not to put that on anybody else, you know, you know, and once again, how potentially egotistical am I to assume that I know everything about whatever people, and I'm not just coming up with some shit, you know? So I don't know that I know necessarily with them, but people don't, you know, they, they're just trying to make it through life half the time. You know, they got their insecurities and their traumas, you know, assuming that I've spent some time trying to unpack all my stuff. I was a, fer a, a ferocious reader. I would just like live in a bookstore from the time I was probably like 22, trying to just understand myself. It's like, if ha people haven't done that, I, I might have a little bit of education behind my belt. So you know, I can't expect this person to just going to be like right there with it. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not even able to do that necessarily. And I try to work on myself all the time, constantly, 100 percent, you know, so it's hard. It's hard because you have to just like accept them with where they are and um, realize they're, you know, they're, they're going to go through it. And you're just going to have to love them somehow, some way anyway, even if it's from afar. So, yeah. Yeah, I was I wasn't there. <laughs> I wasn't at that spot. OK. <laughs> Yeah, and it was it was oh, a new bro. experience for me too because I wasn't I am an empath, but I wasn't used to having that kind of experience where you're picking up on it. Like I really feel for me, it, up until this point, it's been learning that I need to trust myself, and yeah. the more I trust myself, the more proof I have of being accurate in my you know, reasoning about things or, or feelings about things. And uh, a huge part of that is, uh, which MBE help me, helps me with, really anybody who's friends helps me with, is validating that what I'm feeling is okay. Yeah. And that, you know, that it's not, oh, well, I shouldn't be feeling this way because, you know, they're having a rough time and like invalidating everything I'm feeling. Sure. And so mm -hmm. a part of being my friend is like, shut up you're fine no like you, you, you tough love but like yeah. it's still love. feel how you feel and don't invalidate yourself yes exactly yeah yeah <laughs> Absolutely. yeah well you know if you're going to mix it up in the in the, the temporal world you know you're going to rub elbows in the same spaces with people you know there's going to be collateral damage it just kind of comes with okay so you have to accept a certain level of the fact that you know life is a bit ugly at times but we're we're so amazing. We can put people on the on the moon within seconds of our anticipation. But we could also be so able to kill thousands and thousands of people over a stupid idea about stuff too. It's like what there, there's a lot of gray in between all that, right? So mm -hmm. shoulds and yeah, it's a huge net and it's a huge uh, uh, knot that you know we're just kind of picking at. You know what I mean? And I don't think it'll ever ever be finished. Maybe that's part of the irony of life. But everybody's got their own giant knot that they're dealing with. You know. So compassionate at the same time as being somebody who wants to continue to work on development, you know, always just improving it. A, a new top is the beginning of a new bottom to a new top. This is like, this is kind of the way it goes, I think. So, yeah. Well, how do you create boundary boundaries as an empath when you go out into the world? Oh, wow. Um, <clears throat> so first off, I think <laughs> to know that the answer to that question, you have to realize when you don't have boundaries, right? And I, Oh man, yeah. Uh, try to go through this as quickly as possible, but you know, and I'm also thinking about what I should be saying, depending on who's watching. You know, I think a lot of things. I think trauma in past can can help elicit or help give a massive amount of energy behind, you know, fine tuning the elements that we're talking about with being an empath. So I, I have my past traumas as well. I didn't realize that I had them. Um, you know, when you have an imprint of something or a few imprints of something from so far in your past and you, you kind of get to be older, you know, and you become self-aware, you know, there's been stuff that's happening to you before that. So it's almost like there's been programming that has been fine ingrained into you so deep that you forget where it came from. Right. And so basically what I'm saying is, is that before you actually have the capacity to even define boundaries, you're 
your parents and your family, your caretakers have a tendency to be the ones that create boundaries around you. They're protecting you, those kinds of things. Um, if there's traumas, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm only speculating, I'm not a psychologist or anything, but uh, for me, I would say that my lack of ability to create boundaries in the beginning came from not having, not, I mean, it's not even really called boundaries, but, but you know, past abuses and things like that. Um, and so you, you find yourself, you know, I'm in my twenties or whatnot. I had a lot of uh, people pleasing type behaviors. I'd say that I found that I was much more codependent than I would have ever imagined I would be. Um, you know, the, the things that the world tells you to be, be nice, be nice, be nice, that kind of stuff. Um, not being able to handle people being disappointed in me, those kinds of things. Mm. Um, you know, you don't realize how kind of a wash and all that bullshit you really are. Um, but it's also kind of hard to like figure out what to be outside of that. Right. It's like, okay. So I realized that because I'm a people pleaser, I have a tendency to give up my boundaries as bargaining chips for like people sticking around in relationships. Right. Cause I can't handle somebody who, who wants to leave me. It's like such a huge secret or not even knowing that I have shitty self-esteem. Um, but this is what I'm doing. Right. Or, you know, what your ego needs, you know, like I got to date like the hottest, you know, top, top 10, like women on the planet and somehow, some way, you know, that makes me super cool, which is really not because they're a pain in the ass. Really. They're not actually total package, great people. It's like, I'm making bad decisions in my relationships because I'm really trying to, to, to soothe some sort of um, spot or wound or, or, or thing that I wasn't, I don't even really realize was there. You know, it's, it's hard. So you got to unravel all that and then figure out what a damn boundary is. You know, it's like, I can give my belly to people, you know, especially if I've, they've shown a track record of them being caring about me. So it's really hard. I think it's one of those things you kind of feel yourself through. Um, and a lot of that comes through just getting your head knocked in by stupid circumstances or bad choices or whatever else. And so, you know, I can't say that I've ever been the smartest person on the planet. I usually have to learn by like just hitting the pavement, like really fucking hard, you know? And so, and I, and, and that one of the things I will say is that I've, I'm also been one of those people that uh, really, really goes for it. You know, I've lost lots and lots of things in my life and situations, you know, um, had three houses and two businesses at one point, lost it all, you know, uh, pursue passionate relationships because they're passionate, but then also realize the reason why they're passionate is because the opposite side of that is they're crazy, that type of shit. Uh, so, you know, you figure it out because the, the harder you um, you crash, the more rebel you have to pick through, the more you have the ability to kind of, go, oh, okay, you know, and two or three of those types of experiences teaches you a lot. Oh, well, this is what a boundary should be. Um, I'd say that, so, so experience. One of the things that I would say as a side note, and this does come from energy work too, and I have to attribute this to Cassandra and her, her my, my time spending with her is what I kind of coin as resonant tone. Okay. So as an empath, I think one of the things that feels the most exploitive to us when we're not quite sure what the hell is going on is when you're walking through that crowd of people, you realize that everybody's putting off their energy. They may not even be aware of it, but it's, you know, I've got problems here and there. I, you know, I'm, I, I feel insecure. So I'm going to be a giant prick. Like you're walking through all this like ocean of stuff. Mm -hmm. it, if you walk in, instead of taking it on, if you can control your resonant tone, in terms of what I'm putting out there and just have it be more consistent, more solid, um, not necessarily pushing it, because I don't believe that pu pushing it is overcompensation, but actually congruently being it, you'll find that the room, or at least I found that the room shifts to your energy. Because if somebody isn't quite sure that they're putting out energy and you are sure that you are putting out energy, you know, you'll sit right next to somebody and they might have the most hostile thing going on. But if I'm just like, almost like ET, like beaming light, like, right? It's like over a period of time that will soften and at least get better. Like you're not going to fix their problems if that's what's really causing them to have that kind of energy. But um, they're all of a sudden going to be like, I don't know why like, you're kind of cool. You're kind of all right. Like I kind of like, I don't want to kill you. Like I want to kill everybody else in this room. And so for me, one of the biggest ways to bounce that away or create that energetic boundary is to make sure I'm congruent and consistent in my, in my, my, my resonant tone, my, my energy that I put out. So Cassandra had me play video or uh, play energy games. <laughs> it's a funny thing. She would say, "Okay," because I I fashion I, I fancy myself as a as a player and this and that kind of thing. So I want you to go to a place and I want you to sit in a bar and not look at anybody. I want you to put out this energy, you know, magnetism, whatever that feels like to you. And I want to try to see if you can get you know women to talk to you. I got this 65, 70 year old lady named Gladys just flirting with me like crazy. And by the end of it all, it was like so fun. It was so awesome. 
you know, and I was like, damn, I got a crush on Gladys. It was like 65 cent a year. She's a super awesome lady. Her personality was budding, you know, and, but it just became much easier to be able to do that with people. But that was my first experience with it. It was at BJ's on Arden. And she was sitting to the right of me. It's awesome. Super cool fucking lady. And it was just, that was my first experience with that. And I'd have to say, it, I've, I've, I've been a believer in that ever since. So if that helps. That was amazing. <laughs> like I resonated with a lot of what you said, especially like, I don't think I had any boundaries really mm -hmm. growing up. And yeah. I let everybody in. I believe the best in everybody, right. which I've kind of gone the opposite way, but I'm working my way back. You know, it's, it's a tender, <laughs> right? You have to <laughs> go back and forth. Um, but yeah, I, I, I mean, that makes so much sense to, and it's coming, comes with age. Like you, you just, the older you get, the more you realize that wasn't mine. That was never mine. Or this is unacceptable. I won't let this happen like again, because I'm going to, you know, I thought that I trusted myself and then I didn't trust myself. And then I realized, oh, I got into bad situations because I didn't trust myself and I should have trusted myself. Yeah. Um, so it's, and, and even now I'm really starting to step into, okay, I, I need to do a boundary to protect my own energy and all of that. And it's not even necessarily going out into the world. It could be just saying no to somebody and realizing yeah. that uh, you don't have to give an explanation. No is in a complete and a complete yeah. sentence. Actually, yeah, no, uh, yeah. Uh, Stephen Covey, if you read his book, once again, I was a voracious reader. You know, your integrity, your ability, your power it comes becomes better when you can say no. And I noticed that I was never able to say no to anybody because it would just be like, oh, you know, I'm going to disappoint somebody. But what I would find is that people just almost have this intuitive sense that you can't say no, and so then they would just constantly force you to do things. It was almost like. They're not being manipulative. It's just they realize, you know, they're just trying to get their needs met. And so like, well, Nate can't say no. So there you go. Sorry, I didn't mean to interject. <laughs> no, no, no that, that's great. I don't know where I was going, but <laughs> that was that was great. And B, do you have anything to contribute? No. You'll notice I don't talk very much on these. <laughs> yeah. But I want to give you the opportunity. <laughs> the moderator. Go, don't get out of line. We'll turn yeah. you off. She's in charge of one comment. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, Aaron with the comment. Yes. <laughs> if he's, is, I think, Aaron, right? Um, if they're interested in contacting me and wanting to come on and because yeah. they said they're an yeah. empath. So I would love is anybody, to. Is anybody on the feed asking any questions at all? No, it's, it's literally just... Um, it was the very, very first person that came okay. on and says, Hey guys, this is awesome. Excited to hear you all. I'm an empath as well. There you go. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. It's the only comment, but uh, yeah. This is one at a time, baby. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Most people we've ever had, two. <laughs> and we have a love. <laughs> so it's cool. <laughs> well, you know, uh, as far as like boundaries and things like that in the past, you know, the way that I've gotten over, at least portions of the abuse, realizing that I, you know, I have abandonment issues and things like that uh, in the past is, you know, everybody's just doing the best that they can, you know, we're, they're all fumbling through it, you know, and as human beings, we make huge mistakes. We really do. I mean, I know I've definitely made mistakes in terms of the things that like, I, like deep, deep regrets that like, Holy shit. But it's that scared sober moment, you know, and some people just haven't hit that rock bottom. They're dealing with, with turmoil on the inside. I don't know if this is what your experience is like, but most of the time I've had intuitive issues or not issues, but, uh, connections with people, empathic connections with people, is I, I feel their pain more than I feel anything else. Because when somebody's happy, it's kind of like you know you might have a light buzz, but pain is it, like it cuts mm -hmm. boom, right to right to here for me and right to here for me. It's like holy shit, you know. And of course, being somebody who's a people pleaser, I found myself building and making friends because of being able to just naturally understand where people were kind of coming from, not knowing what I was really doing. And also that Matt might even be a bit potentially exploitive and manipulative in the sense that. I really needed to have friends. I needed to have people that liked me, right? So got to be careful with all that. But, you know, past abusers, you know, it's one of those things is like I've had people some do horribly, her, her, you know, horrendous shit to me, you know, and like knowing that a lot of that is chaos and I feel it, my body feels it. It's like, I'm, I'm never going to talk to you again, but also like having that feeling of deep love for them too, understanding that they're, they're in their process as well, you know, and that, I mean, once again, this is speaking from the vantage point. Like, I think I know what would be best for them. You know, I have to really make sure that I don't allow my ego to get out of check that way. But, you know, they're, they've got their, they've got their walls and their labyrinths of their mind and all that kind of stuff as well. And, you know, and so it's really weird to like, 
really dislike somebody, but also love them to death too, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, if that's a summary for anything, I think about the past tra tra traumatic things it's like, yeah, they're just idiots going through shit just like I was or I am still, you know, at whatever level I'm at. So, but it still sucks. It's still rough. Pain in the ass for sure. <laughs> so, you know. Everybody's just doing the best they can with the tools that they've been provided with. And um, I've gotten into some bad situations myself as well. I don't like the fact that from who, from people I've talked to, it feels very much like empaths have a shared pain past. Sure. And I mean, that's part of being human as well. Like you experience pain to mm -hmm. and you learn from that pain to make better decisions in the future, hopefully. Mm -hmm. uh, typically it's after you've hit rock bottom, which I'm not a fan of. Yeah. But it, uh, I, the person who helped me hit, hit, rock, hit rock bottom, um, I understand where they were coming from. They were probably going through a really hard time. I get that, but I don't want to have anything to do with them ever again. Right. And, you know, so it's, you can see where other people are coming from as an empath, but that doesn't excuse their behavior. Sure. And oh, absolutely. You yeah. take care of yourself. And if you need to take a step back for wh whatever reason or just end it, then um, I feel like we need to respect each other and ourselves in making those decisions. I think it's a huge point. I, I, it's one of those things where I think that's kind of the crux of what it is. It's like just because you know, I feel a larger connection to, you know, the greater good or, you know, the universe or like whatever you want to define, whatever, whatever word or vocabulary you want to go ahead and utilize does not excuse people from the, the traumas and collateral damage that they, that they cause. And so boundaries going back and maybe tying it in is understanding what that is for you. Um, and, you know, the interesting and crazy part or scary part is that you can define boundaries any way you want. And that's kind of the point, right? So I'm going to define boundaries today, but also I have to take into account that, you know, I'm, I'm at a, I'm an idiot at this level. And at some point I might rise to the next level, upgrade or whatnot, and I have to redefine what those boundaries are. But being able to do that is an important kind of a thing. And so it's how you filter the chaos in your life. You know, even though you might be somebody who still has things and portions of you that absolutely pull chaos into your life. So it's, it's a very ironic, like abstract, almost paradoxical type experience, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, I feel like as you were saying, every time you get to a new level, you're still yourself, but you're learning, okay, how is this new person, new version of me sure. needing to create a boundary to protect myself or to give myself enough energy or what, what have you? Yeah, and you can just define the boundary because you just don't like it. Like that, that's kind of the thing too, is I think what's always supposed to be based and, and stooped in some sort of well, it's based off the criteria under which I read in this book that this is how a healthy relationship goes. It's like, no, I don't like it. Fuck it. I'm not doing it. You know, and like being able to say no, once again, going back to Stephen Covey or whatnot, it's like, no, no, I don't want to, you know, and, and not want to even in the um, the face of potential, you know, public shame, you know, that kind of stuff, right? The trolls or whatnot, right? It's like that shit's rampant these days. You know, we're, we're living our lives in front of people and strangers far more often than we might imagine ourselves doing ever in the history of, of, of whatever. So they're going to be people that would never ever say that to your face, you know, that are going to start talking some shit. Well, you know what, if they're willing to go ahead and take the opportunity to sneak in a little jab, it's like, you also have to be strong, resolute in yourself enough to be able to be like, no, why? Cause I don't fucking want to. That's why period mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be based on anything else. I mean, it should ideally, you know, at some point, but it doesn't feel good to me. So don't, you know, yeah, a lot of times that voice sounds like a child to me. He's like, I don't wanna. Fuck <laughs> okay, it, let him ride, you know? I mean, um, yeah, you know, that voice in your head isn't 100% of who you are, but it definitely has, it, it's out there looking out for you. I don't care if it's a child or not, you know? Um, I forgot what books or whatever, they, they, they talked about your inner child and things like that. And it's like, yeah, well, call it your inner child because you, you need to make sure you take care of it and honor it. You have to honor how you feel, even if it's, you know, people use validation, but honor how you feel, um, but not, not excuse yourself from growth because of how you feel, you know, our mm -hmm. pain is our pain, but it's not one of those things where it's like, well, now because I'm in pain, I, I, I get to do whatever the hell it is that I want, you know, it's okay. That, th this pain is pointing me towards something, you know, that I have the opportunity That's to fix. The difference between being a victim or like I, the phrasing with that, mm -hmm. you know, it's like sometimes you've, been in pain and stuff, but you're not taking on the victim title. You're like, okay, yeah. this happened to me, but I'm choosing to grow. Whereas the people who um, are like, no, I'm a victim, they're using that to let them, to give them excuses so 
for not growing. Yeah, it's a difference between doing, maybe it'd be described as a difference between being a victim or being victimized, right? Yeah, or, or, or um, you know, it's it's not your fault, but it's your responsibility, right? And we hate that, right? Because, you know, at the end of the day, well, here's an interesting thing. I mean, this is just a reflection of my own experience, but, you know, the thing about people being a victim, I understand that people are, in fact, victims at times, and they need to take the time to, to heal themselves emotionally or whatnot. The thing about getting stuck in victimhood is that it's a great way to make power, like, um, if you ever watch Teal Swan on um, YouTube, which I used to watch quite a few years back, she talks about the victim control tactic. So the thing is, is that for somebody who's not a sincere victim, um, it's a great way to gain power. And this is a potential problem. It's it's great in the sense that it makes you more, it elicits more attention and response than being somebody who's actually valuable. But mm -hmm. the problem is it's always based in some sort of empathy. So number one, this person is always creating strife in their life. And, and just like if you talk about that resonant tone, they're creating, whether they realize it or not, this drama that like it's always something horrible happening. And then when it gets quiet for a while, there has to be a new horrible thing that happens to them so that you, you know, you empathize. Right. So it's it's gaining more attention than if you were to like not be on the radar at all. But it also gets you stuck in the sense that it doesn't allow you. You have to stay a victim. So you can't empower yourself anymore either. Right. So you have to find ways to be like. Okay, I'm. I yes, I feel victimized as hell right now. <laughs> Fuck, but but I'm gonna work on this. I'm gonna work on this shit. I'm gonna work on this shit, and and get better. And then at some point, this will no longer bother me. But it's a very seductive place to go ahead and be a victim potentially. So victimized, not a victim. That's where I, I try to. It's not always easy because our pain definitely creeps right back into our body and 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 want to lash out. We are animals to a degree at, at some point, but try not to get stuck in there. You know, is what I'm what I say to myself. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I agree. So we only have a couple more minutes sure. until like two. So if, if there's anything that you want to say or leave it with any advice to fellow empaths that are trying to, you know, find their journey. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, as far as giving advice, you know, um, I see a lot of people that would have the same kind of, not quirks, but like, there are people that may not call themselves an empaths or whatnot that I see as very much just like empaths. I mean, good friends of mine, Dennis Glasgow has been our, our my acting teacher for a long time, but he may not quantify himself as an empath, but he's definitely very intuitive and empathically. You know, it, it comes in the form of maybe even feeling like compassion. So there's a lot more people out there like that than maybe we might be aware of. Um, to recognize the ability to be compassionate that way um, or artistic or creative, you know, to me, it all kind of comes from the same source if, if I had to go and quantify it. So, you know, I'm, I love the idea or, or the feeling of the fact that, you know, you guys might consider me that. And I think that's great. It's not just necessarily what it is that I am. So I, I just would encourage people to indulge that, that feeling within them a bit more, you know, because we would so far so often repress, um, like we shouldn't, you know, you asked me at one point what it was like to be male on an empath, right? And I would say this is like, yeah, in general, you know, I wouldn't say that men are, are it might seem like that men are being told to go ahead and put their feelings aside. I would say for me, it, it feels a responsibility to not allow my emotions to uh, dictate uncontrollably what it is that I do, you know? So what that allows me to, to do is like, it, it provides this kind of calm, quiet space to be more intuitive to just sit and be a little bit more quiet and listen you know i think if people did that type of stuff a bit more often indulged and believed in that just a little bit more i think there would be a lot of ancillary good that would come out of it um connections you know just overall improvement um uh, of your relationships because people want to be heard for sure so if you're a good listening ear just by default that helps um you know just indulge in those Honor those things that are within the inside of those inspirations, those little embers of, of you know, hope or compassion. Or, you know, if you see somebody on the street and you feel like, uh, well, go just run with it. Go do it. You know, because I think that's that's a, that's a beginning um, a set of steps to kind of improve humanity as a whole. And I think that's what empaths are really kind of trying to do for themselves, but also for the people around them. So to me, somehow that all kind of coalesces into like a greater good of some point. So I, I, I'm honored to, to think that people might consider me somebody who's an empath or empathic, but you know, it, it, this has allowed me to make a lot of positive change in my life. Uh, teaching people, I'm not quite sure, but I think if they just allowed themselves to feel deeply about things greater than themselves a little bit more, then then we would all probably benefit from it a lot more. We would probably all benefit from a lot. So yeah. 
I don't know. Those are not like the most articulate words on the planet, but you know, maybe the energy is getting put out there. <laughs> so. I'm not that articulate either. So it's fine. It happens. And MB's just quiet. <laughs> I'm the listener. Yes. Yes. We need to have listeners for sure. So, so okay, I would, I'd love to be able to maybe to like download this and then post it on my channel at some point, but you know, everybody go follow Hillary on, on her empath books and YouTube follow her, or her social media stuff. Oh say. yeah, I should start doing that. <laughs> I should start at the end, yeah. just be like, I'll post it all. Um, and the button button. <laughs> it is. Subscribe button. Subscribe, right? I do the subscribe button on YouTube now. Yeah. So um, I can put it in the comments after the afterwards. I can put all the ways to contact me, and then, um, yeah, you said you wanted to share it, so it should just on because it's through Facebook Live and YouTube Live, so it should automatically just be there yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna download it i know how to do things because i'm technology inclined or whatever uh, and I'll, I'll i'll slap i'll slap it up on mine you know and, and also put the same links and things like that so but yeah your book congratulations you know get the next one out and then the next one and the next one and all of a sudden you'll hit critical mass and boom so. <laughs> right now there's only one more <laughs> okay. then there might be a third one i'm being told there might there will be a third one but uh being told mm. spiritually but I'm, I'm not ready to be there yet i need to finish one and then potentially write an entirely different novel and then go back to maybe doing you know what? what whatever you're feeling we're just, just going to honor that darling we're just going to go with that <laughs> yeah <laughs> sounds good so for our next one i don't have a I haven't contacted the person yet, so I don't have a date and I don't have any specifics on that yet, but I will keep everybody posted. I'm mostly on Facebook because um, I love Facebook and I'm addicted to it. Uh, <laughs> I try to post on Instagram and um, Twitter as well, but definitely Facebook is the uh, best way to get at me. <laughs> yeah, if you want to access me in any way, that's probably the best way. Um, okay, well, thank you, Nate, so much for Thanks. coming. Thanks, guys. I feel very honored for being here. I appreciate. I'll be looking up your stuff in the future. So, thank, thank you, thank you so much for having me. Awesome, thank you so much for coming, and I will talk to you and other people later. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>